1 Samuel 16, starting at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for, for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the, the leaders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they, saw Sam, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well, and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and he is a fine looking man. The Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. So David took a donkey loaded with so Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armour bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. This is the word of God. When God's word is read, God speaks. Amen. Thank you guys very much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Have you <clears throat> ever heard of a guy called Roy Brooks, real estate agent in London in the 1960s? No? Well, Roy Brooks was, uh, became famous for a very unusual habit he had, especially peculiar for his occupation. It was his ability to, in his ads on the newspaper, uh, to be brutally honest about the properties he was selling. So who could resist, you know, making an appointment to view a bargain described thus? Wanted. Someone with taste, means and a stomach strong enough to buy this erstwhile house of ill repute in Pimlico. It is untouched by the 20th century as far as conveniences for even the basic human decencies are concerned. Although it reeks of damp, or worse, 
the plaster is coming off the walls and daylight peeps through a hole in the roof. It is still habitable judging by the bed of rags, fag ends and empty bottles in one corner. Plenty of scope for the socially aspiring to express their decorative taste and get their abode in the glossy and nothing to stop them putting Westminster on their notepaper. Comprises 10 rather unpleasant rooms with slimy backyard, 4,650 freehold. That, would that have interested you, I wonder? Um, would you have gone for that? I think there's plenty more descriptions if you Google uh, Roy Brooks. But maybe he was somebody who read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, and believed that appearances don't matter nearly as much as the heart, and that being truthful was more important than making yourself or your properties look good. Maybe. Um, don't think so. But I don't know about you, but I've read this verse many times before, and I thought that the main way to apply it to my life was to say to myself, I shouldn't judge other people or even uh, situations by what they look like. Maybe you've even taught that uh, to others. But is it why God put it here in our Bibles? Is today's passage nothing short of maybe a bit of a guilt-tripping exercise to change our motivations? There is something much larger, I think, in God's inspired scriptures uh, than a simple moral lesson. It is clear that 1 Samuel 16 shows what God is going to do when the king that his people chose sinfully is rejected. We will see uh, how God chooses his new king, and his anointed one, and hopefully that's going to point us to his ultimate king, Jesus Christ, uh, and David points to him. That's why I've divided our passage today into two main points. We're going to be in two people's houses, uh, at Jesse's house, uh, so David's dad, we learn that appearances don't appear to matter nearly as much as the heart. And that's the first half of the passage. And the second half, at Saul's house, the palace, we learn that away from the Lord, even the mighty can fall. So a bit of context, as you've heard from that, that video, that was awesome. Thanks for that, Matt. Uh, Saul was chosen by the people for the people. Samuel, and most importantly God, saw uh, that he was kind of... The people were disloyal because they wanted a king uh, like to be like the other nations rather than to be ruled by God, which would have been far better. Uh, and they were so bent on this that God said, okay, you can, you can have a king. But as Saul's reign moves forward, we find out that his heart isn't in obeying God at all. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, uh, he disobeys Samuel and usurps his role as someone who performs a sacrifice. That's Samuel's job. Uh, and as a result, Samuel, Samuel says, uh, your kingdom is going to be taken away from you. And then in 1 Samuel 14, Saul makes a vow that would have killed his son uh, if it were not for other people who loved Jonathan. And lastly, in 1 Samuel 15, just before our passage, Samuel uh, lets us know that someone can't be king of God's people uh, if they don't understand that obedience is an attitude of the heart rather than just coming to church or being, doing rituals. Uh, that's where we hit Samuel 16, which is where we are today. The king God's rebellious people had chosen failed to trust their true king, the Lord. What's God going to do? He's going to choose a new king, now to be revealed. But before we come to the first verse, just as we continue, uh, I want to prevent us from when we read an Old Testament passage, one of the things we're not thinking is, oh, I must be like David. Or I must be like Samuel, or so and so in the story. Whatever God tells any of the characters in the story, He's first, uh, before we think about ourselves, He's telling them and not us. Otherwise, reading the Bible like a bit of an exercise of copy and pasting our names on the main characters can uh, help us to end up with some really confusing or straight up heretical uh, ideas if we're not careful. But what we get to see is that whatever God is like in this passage, uh, if you're a Christian today, if you love Jesus, that God, that impressive God, is your God too, and mine. So we want to be impressed, impressed by God in that way. So first point, at Jesse's house, what do we learn? That appearances don't appear to matter nearly as much as the heart. So look at the first verse there. Uh, there's the whole deal with the horn with oil. And you're familiar with prime ministers being elected and kings, queens and presidents being sworn into office. 
Well, here a prophet anoints the king, pours a bit of oil on him, in order to symbolize that he is a king under a greater authority, God. So he's set apart for God's uh, use. And in verses 2 to 5, I'll be referring to the passage as you keep your Bibles open, God tells Samuel to go with the aim of sacrificing to him, though the greater goal is for him to find a new king. And the motive is true, God's not lying, he isn't dealing treacherously, deceiving anyone, but using wisdom to kind of accomplish that purpose. And then verses 6 to 13 is where the meat of our passage really is, that appearances don't appear to matter nearly as much as the heart. It must have been quite frustrating to be told that you're rejected or passed over as Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, uh, David's other brothers. Maybe it would have felt like an X Factor episode where their performance was told that they just wasn't good enough, except that that's not what God says. God doesn't say he's not good enough. He says, I have not chosen this one. It's kind of important to emphasize this, isn't it? Because it wasn't anything to do with the appearance of these lads that God rejected, but it was something to do with how God was choosing. And how was he choosing? Was God teaching Samuel that he shouldn't have cared about appearances when choosing God's king? If that's the case, uh, then God would want us to not consider other people's appearance, right? In that case, uh, how many of you have chosen to marry a person you consider to be beautiful and attractive? Yeah? Okay, this is the time for you husbands particularly uh, to raise your hands. Well, then maybe the Bible is telling you to come up the front and repent because you chose them because they were beautiful and attractive. Well, I guess that isn't what the passage is telling us, not to consider someone's appearance. Uh, otherwise, he shouldn't have chosen David. Look with me. Verse 12, he's described as glowing with health, having a fine appearance, handsome features. Verse 13, the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord, was going to come powerfully on him. He is a great music therapy practitioner, according to verse 18, and knows how to play the lyre well enough to calm, uh, uh, to calm down Saul's tormenting spirit. And still on verse 18, he's a warrior, a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. What's not to like? So, just why then did God choose him, if not for his impressive appearance and his great CV here? Well, it's more the case, as we read on, that it's, whatever someone's physical appearance may be, God isn't choosing them or rejecting them based on their appearance. They may be handsome and skilled, or they may not. They may enjoy great public support, or maybe nobody knows about them. The fact of the matter is, as one commentator puts it, external appearance neither qualifies nor disqualifies. It simply does not matter. If Samuel had been left to choose on his own, we would have ended up with Saul, Act 2, right? Another king chosen by appearance, and Eliab fitted the, uh, the, the great description. But would he and his brothers have looked so impressive in front of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, the next chapter? Would their impressiveness have been any good when the threat against God's people was taller uh, than any soul could match up against? As a matter of fact, if you look in your Bibles in 1 Samuel 17, 3, you will learn that David's siblings, in fact, were there when Goliath was challenging God's people. Yet it was only David, God's chosen one, who had the heart to uh, trust God as the one who enabled him. So what does it mean? to talk about the heart as the thing that matters. Well, the idea of the heart in our Bibles is linked with someone's uh, moral life, their spiritual life of faith. It isn't just about their emotions, but their emotions, their will, their thinking, their reasoning. And when you consider that, uh, when we talk about the heart, it covers all of that, it becomes a lot easier to understand uh, how God sees. We can predict maybe uh, whether someone can lift heavy weights by whether they look lanky, like me, or like a bodybuilder. We can tell whether someone is going to win a beauty pageant uh, by their looks. But here's what we can't tell uh, just from someone's appearance. Whether they're going to be faithful in obedience to God 
or whether they're going to give into sin in the long run. Can't tell that. And in 1 Samuel uh, 13, 14, God told Saul that his kingdom wouldn't continue because he had been disobedient. And it reads like this, verse 14. But now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has looked for the kind of man he wants, or in another translation, a man after his own heart. The Lord has appointed him to become ruler of his people. He is doing this because you haven't obeyed his command. Do you get that so far? The lesson isn't, oh, you shouldn't care about someone's appearance. Neither is the lesson, try to be good and not judge people. The point is, appearances don't matter nearly as much as the heart does. And if we don't look at the heart, we're going to be far and away from God's plan for our lives, for the world. But as 21st century Christians, what does that mean for us? Well, clearly for David, being after God's own heart, or being the kind of man God wants in another translation, wasn't about being perfect. Remember the affair that he had with Bathsheba? He murdered her husband. Plenty of other things for you to read about David's mistakes. He wasn't perfect at all. But being after God's heart wasn't about obeying the Lord perfectly. Uh, it was about having a heart that would obey the Lord, and when you sinned, you would ask for forgiveness. Uh, so every time he sinned, he repented. This meant turning from his sins, asking for forgiveness, and letting God change him by his power. So if we aim to see the heart, rather than uh, only someone's outward appearance, are we going to judge our spiritual leaders, say our jam leaders here, pastors, uh, whoever we choose in our denominations, by their maybe university pieces of paper? or by their godly hearts? Are we going to judge other Christians by how much money they make, or by whether they're generous with it? What about judging other Christians by how successful their children are, instead of how godly they've been as parents? There are plenty more examples, but as I said above, this passage isn't just telling us to be good, but to align ourselves, our thinking, with what our God is like. After all, what is the worst thing that could happen if we only saw someone's outward appearance and didn't consider uh, their heart? Well, first of all, we would reject a lot of people that God loves and wants to save. Have you ever had that feeling of really disliking somebody? I trust that you have. Have you ever thought... Uh, but I don't want these people here particularly to be saved. I want them to burn, you know? If so, you're not alone. I recently read a book on evangelism where there was a whole chapter dedicated to, you know, how do you pray through loving people? Or you might not want to reach out to someone in the LGBT community because you feel uncomfortable. Whereas God loves them, uh, wants to reach out to them. You may not want to interact with people who are significantly poorer than you, or dirtier than you, as if they're below your status? What about avoiding those people who are uncool, unpopular, unimpressive? We all know who they are, at work, at school, even here at church. Whether you're a teenager, a child, or an adult. And secondly, so we would reject people uh, that God wants to save, if you only looked at outward appearance, but ultimately, we would reject God himself. It was really unlikely that God should choose the smallest, less impressive member of Jesse's family, sure. But compare that with how unlikely it would have been for God to choose uh, Jesus of Nazareth to be king. This is the most remarkable thing that we see in 1 Samuel 16, that God shows Samuel that if we neglect to consider someone's faithfulness to God, because we're kind of deceived by how impressive they look outwardly, we're never truly going to know God because Jesus gave us plenty of reasons not to be impressed by him. Let me just quote a few to you. In Mark 6, some people said of Jesus, this dude is just one of us. There's nothing impressive about him. They asked, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Some other people said, oh, Jesus has way too much fun. Uh, Matthew 11 John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. 
The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet other people said, Jesus isn't even from the right place. In John chapter 7, still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Doesn't scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And one of my personal favorites, if Jesus is a Messiah, he shouldn't suffer. Matthew 27, if he is the king, then let him come down now from the cross. Then we will believe him. But one last quote from Isaiah 53, most remarkably, it says this about Jesus. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. So when we read verses 6 and 7 in 1 Samuel 16, we, if you're a Christian, are called to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. Which means that if you're a Christian, you're a servant of God. And every challenge that you have today uh, is an opportunity for you to uh, have your character transformed into someone who, like God, sees the heart and He's transforming your heart. Your response to how you look at people and mine, uh, their need for the gospel, is not going to take into account their status, how much money they make, as much as they need to come under God's rule, under King Jesus, who still looks, to many people today, a really unimpressive person. So let's just look at this, let it soak into our hearts and marvel that God chose somebody like David, ultimately chose somebody like Jesus, uh, and chose people like us, who are really weak um, and couldn't save ourselves. So very quickly, uh, at, at our second uh, stop at Saul's house, the palace, we learn that away from the Lord, even the mighty fall. It seems to me that sometimes when we read the Bible, the Bible is going to show us uh, examples of what a life looks like without God to help us savor the privilege of being His children. And I think a little bit of that is help happening here in the house of Saul. Isn't it interesting that in verse 14, in one line, God's Spirit leaves Saul and enters David. What a powerful picture of God's choosing a new king. God then allows a harmful spirit to torment Saul. And in the following verses, Saul ends up a disobedient, failed king who now needs the help of the rightful king that God chose. Otherwise, he's going to be tormented. We have talked loads already about how seeing as God sees helps us to see Him uh, and join His family. And this is a terrifying picture of what being away from the Lord, not being a Christian, not being a follower of Jesus, ultimately looks like. David isn't chosen by God uh, only, but also by Saul, who needs him now. In fact, whatever souls we come up with, uh, in our lives, as we choose instead of God, ultimately are going to fall, just as the mighty soul falls uh, before God in 1 Samuel. We see how God chooses, okay, fine, but doesn't that make you want to ask, how do I choose? Or in other words, the fact that we can choose idols, things or people, to replace God's place and rule in our lives, rather than the Lord Jesus. As we kind of start with, uh, finishing, wrapping up, if we see as God sees, then our ultimate loyalty is not to our spouse, our bank account, a friend at school, a job, our children, but our ultimate loyalty is to the Lord Jesus, who is our security and identity. That means we, are, you and I, are challenged to ask ourselves, for example, when you think of your children, is their academic success your first priority? Or is it investing in their walk with God? Would you sacrifice a club so that they could come on Sundays? Are you most proud when they do well at school or when they do something right and obey God? 
when they display godliness? How many words do I use to praise their school successes in, in their various activities? But how many words and how often do we praise them because of their godly choices? Is our ultimate loyalty with our spouse, if you're married? Uh, do we make decisions ultimately based on them or on living as godly husbands and wives for the kingdom of God? Is Jesus king over my life or is my work, uh, whether at school uh, or otherwise, what rules me? Does my success at work dominate my choices and my emotions? You know, interestingly, one of my friends at uh, Woodlands in Alistair just recently turned down a £4,000 raise because he thought that taking it would have encroached on his family time, and his, uh, which is his primary responsibility, and his ability to uh, serve the church. He sacrificed the raise for the gospel. There are many challenges here for all of us. Please don't think that these things don't challenge me. They really do challenge me as well as you. But if you're a follower of Jesus today, you serve the same God who was merciful, gracious, and forgiving to David. And this same God doesn't look for a sinless, perfect life. He's not expecting that. But just as David was someone who could be forgiven, so can we. It's with our eyes open by God that we marvel at his choice uh, for the ultimate king of our lives, Jesus, God's anointed king. What matters most isn't uh, your appearance or mine, but how he has begun to change us if you're a Christian today. And he's going to finish that only on the day that Jesus comes back. As one famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once said as we finish, if he gives you the grace to make you believe, to make you a Christian, he will give you the grace to live a holy life afterward. Let me pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is in your Bible, 1 Samuel 16. We thank you that appearances don't matter nearly as much as the heart. Thank you that even though Jesus uh, when he came was unimpressive to many people the things that he did and said showed he was the son of God the only one that can make us whole the only one that can forgive us I praise you uh, Lord Jesus that you died for us um, you've shown us a little bit of what life can be like away from you we would totally not want to be like Saul we want to be like people uh, who are forgiven by you who are a part of your family thank you that you've chosen to save us uh, for those of us who have chosen to love you we praise you and we thank you for uh, this uh, amazing truth about yourself in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>